Good morning, everybody. As you just heard, I'm Ruth Katz, Director of the Health Medicine and Society Program at the Aspen Institute. We are going to move quickly into our next panel because when we talk about the front lines of Medicare and Medicaid and what it takes for programs to work on both the federal and state levels, there's a lot of ground to cover. I'm sure you would agree. And we've brought together the right people to do just that. And Walter Isaacson is here to tell you more about those folks. Walter is president and CEO of the Aspen Institute, my boss. And as many of you know, he is also a celebrated journalist and biographer. He has long been interested in leadership and how creative people make things happen. Benjamin Franklin, Henry Kissinger, Steve Jobs, and Albert Einstein are just some of the great thinkers and doers who have been the subject of his lucid prose. Walter, thanks so much for being here and for guiding us to the next panel. Walter Isaacson. Well, then let me have the great honor and pleasure to introduce uh, Governor Sebelius and Governor Levitt. Uh, they've also both been Secretaries of Health and Human Services, but we all agreed that of every job in America, especially of all jobs that Lyndon Johnson never actually held, the job of governor is the one you kind of wear the rest of your life, because you remember you actually got a whole lot accomplished. Having said that, as secretaries of Health and Human Services, both uh, uh, Mike Levitt and Kathleen Sebelius also got an enormous amount accomplished. Um, Mike Levitt served George W. Bush from 2005 to 2009, and of course, um, Governor Sebelius was under President Obama uh, 2009 to 2014, especially during the Affordable Care Act years. They also over oversaw the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, and that's what we're going to talk about some. Uh, Governor Levitt was deeply involved in implementing Medicare Part D. Both were vigorous uh, proponents for the reauthorization of CHIP, the children's uh, program, and got it done. But in some ways, I think their perspective as governors, having to administer especially things like Medicaid, uh, will bring a particular insight here. So it's my pleasure to introduce two very close friends of the Aspen Institute. Uh, both were there last summer. Both, I hope, will be there again this summer, Governor Sebelius and Governor Levitt. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Great. Um, you once said, uh, Governor Levitt, when you were the secretary, that you thought Medicare and Medicaid might be drifting towards disaster. How did you help stop that, and are we still in a problem where you feel that could happen? Well, at the time I made the statement, um, we were moving toward a period of time where the trust fund would be insolvent. Every spring about this time, the trust fund uh, uh, trustees meet. Uh, Secretary Sebelius, or Governor Sebelius and I both had that mm -hmm. experience, and we would go into a room at the Treasury uh, in a very unheralded meeting, but we would all sit around, and the government actuary would tell us the results. And the reality was uh, we were moving uh, in, a, in a way that the trust fund would become insolvent. And while that date has been delayed some, there is still the fundamental problem that uh, we are spending more than we take in. The trust fund is slowly being depleted. That doesn't make Medicare anything uh, but good. It just simply means we have to deal with that problem. And so it's mainly Medicare you're talking about in which the trust fund is being depleted. And how would you solve that if you could do it with just a stroke of a pen? Well, <laughs> <laughs> We're in a fantasy world here. Well, actually, uh, Hall. It, 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 is a, it is a very complex question, but I would tell you I think there are things that need to be done. Uh, the first is that the whole incentives of Medicare, and I think uh, uh, Secretary Governor Sebelius would agree with this, that, that, that I'm sorry, uh, Kathleen uh, would, would agree with this, that, the, uh, that the, all of the incentives in Medicare are basically built around more. Uh, the pr provider or gain more money if they do more procedures. Uh, the patient has no incentive for anything other than that, and those who are, 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 are paying it have the same. So just being able to align them to begin to reward value instead of just volume is, and this is true of the commercial market too, but Medicare is the largest payer. 
I, I would say that um, if I learned one thing as Secretary of Health, it would be that if you want to reform health care, you have to modernize Medicare because it's the only system that literally is imbued in the entire system of health nationwide. Mm -hmm. um, Governor Sebelius, I'm going to give you this magic pen. What would you do with it to reform Medicare and more broadly, the whole health system? Well, I would, I would agree with... Um, my friend and colleague, uh, Mike Levitt, that um, reforming health care really is uh, and starts with reforming Medicare uh, because it touches every hospital, every doctor, every provider group, every drug company, every medical device company. So um, what I heard over and over again when I first came in from both private employers and uh, the best leaders of health systems is we live in two worlds. We're trying to move to value-based propositions. Mm -hmm. We're trying to shift. Medicare is firmly planted in the 20th century. Mm -hmm. Total fee-for-service, more you do, the more you get paid. Outcomes are not looked at, measured. I think actually, Walter, the, maybe the single most important um, frame of the Affordable Care Act. A lot of attention has been paid to the marketplace and um, expansion of affordable coverage for people who didn't have it, and that's critical. But there is a provision that for the first time in history allows the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services to test various kinds of protocol that are designed to decrease costs in the children's insurance program, in Medicaid, and in Medicare. And if they find and certify by the actuary that this is actually a cost reduction and quality is at a minimum maintained or ideally increased, they can bring it to scale administratively. Mm -hmm. No longer demonstration projects. So they, they are on a very aggressive timetable. Give me an example or two where that worked. Okay, so um, one of the focus areas was uh, in the last couple of years, well, I'll give you two, um, were on hospital-acquired conditions where... Infections? Infections, wrong drugs, wrong surgery, whatever. Not what brought you to the hospital, no. but what happens to you in the hospital. And 50, 60,000 people a year die, and millions more are injured, and have longer hospital stays. So the federal government and CMS said, we're gonna pay attention to this. We're gonna have a baseline and new hospital systems um, have to take this very seriously and we're going to begin to deduct payments if your infection rate doesn't start to drop. For the first time in history, there is a 17% drop in overall hospital acquired conditions nationwide that is roughly $12 billion in savings and millions of people who are spending less time and getting out. Same with readmissions. Those are on the minus side, people who mm -hmm. circulated right back in and didn't um, you know, see a provider. But I think there's a lot of plus side going on. Uh, the new accountable care organizations, a different alignment of doctors and patients in Medicare with the goal of keeping people healthy in the first place. Uh, in other words, they take a whole population. They take a whole population, population. they're risk-based, but if there are savings from reduced hospitalizations, from people mm -hmm. staying healthier, the doctors share in part of that cost and the patients clearly um, are better off and the government shares. We have the lowest health inflation for the last five years that we've had in 50 years, mm -hmm. and that includes Medicare and what Medicaid. What proportion of that is because of the Affordable Care Act? I don't know. I think it's impossible, though, to say at this point, five years out, that mm -hmm. it is not part of the framework. Uh, oh, certainly the recession yeah. started it, but um, mm -hmm. whatever's going on for the first time, mm -hmm. health care costs are trending with GDP, which hasn't happened. Medicare went from six to eight percent year in year out increases last year it was a 0.2 percent 0.2 mm -hmm. so the cost increases in medicare are not because of health costs going up it's because the population is 11,000 people a day are turning 65 and coming in so right. we have a per capita costs have never looked like this before Walter, could i put a just a punctuation point on this um 
There was a provision in the law uh, in about five years ago that if Medicare ever got to the point that it exceeded, that, that the support for Medicare exceeded 45% coming from the general budget, that there was a responsibility of the secretary to notify Congress and to present a plan to remedy it. I happened to be the secretary when we crossed 45% of the support of Medicare coming from general tax revenues, and so I met that obligation by going to Congress and saying to them, uh, you've now crossed this threshold. I have an obligation to present you with an alternative on how you can heal this. And I, by the way, have created a list of $168 billion of options, and the deficit is $3 billion. And so your job to solve this would be to take the $168 billion list and, and select three. three of them, uh, $3 billion, to, to satisfy it. Well, it was... Um, they just changed the law and said they didn't have a requirement uh, to heal it. Now, the reason that's relevant and the reason that it's important on the 50th anniversary of Medicare to talk about this is because the Affordable Care Act, in order to pay for it, requires that we find $500 billion in savings from Medicare in order to fund the Affordable Care Act. Now, where is that going to come from? Well, it's going to come from, if it's not found in Medicare, it'll come from the general fund, which competes with everything else. So my point is, as I, your question about drifting toward disaster, we're here to celebrate the 50th anniversary and to recognize that it is vitally important that we find ways to fix this because it's such an important part of the fabric of America. But if the Congress is unable on its own to find $3 billion, how are they actually going to find $500 billion? Mm -hmm. Now, you can put me on the skeptical side on that one, if you will, but I think what Kathleen is speaking of, that the system now has to become more efficient through means of changing the way we approach this becomes important for the next 50 years of Medicare. And that's the underlying solution as opposed to just Congress making a few fixes is to have it changed the whole way medical care is provided? I, in, in my view, the political will does not exist to solve this problem legislatively. Mm -hmm. the and Congress, that's what's so important about that piece of legislation the, is... The Congress has to create a mechanism mm -hmm. by yeah. which the marketplace begins to prioritize what's done and begin to find ways of making the system more efficient. Medicare is often thought of as efficient the inefficiency in Medicare is that we don't, it isn't that we can't issue a check efficiently. Medicare issues a billion checks a year and does it cheaper than anybody else in the world. Mm -hmm. What it doesn't do as well as it must is to find ways in which we are healing the overutilization in care and beginning to squeeze out the inefficiency that is very much a part you of the You and system. I had a, what I thought was a fascinating dinner, just the two of us in the restaurant just a few blocks from here, in which on a napkin, we don't have any napkins here, so I'm not sure I can ask you to do it on a napkin, you sketched out a different type of model for how you would do population care and make things more affordable. Please explain that to us. Well, for those who don't follow this as closely, uh, the idea, currently, um, anyone who gets a hospital bill will see that it's itemized. Um, in a thousand different ways. And there's a bill for the aspirin and a bill for the Tylenol and a bill for the bandage and a bill for the surgeon and so forth. And there's no coordination. Uh, it's an uncoordinated system. And if there's one thing you can get Republicans and Democrats to agree on, in fact, I think there are a couple of things. One is that uncoordinated care is not as good as coordinated care. And the second is that this system we're talking about that Kathleen and I have both spoken of, this fee-for-service system is the enemy of efficiency. And so you have to create a set, a set of accountabilities where someone is taking responsibility to coordinate the care and to provide and, and to both keep the patients happy and to keep it within balance. And that's the essential direction that I think you can get Republicans and Democrats to agree upon. And But that would be creating both coverage and um, supply of health care within the same organization? There's, there's little doubt that it is a widely held American aspiration for every American to have access to health insurance, and I don't think that has changed. Mm -hmm. uh, there's differences of opinion on how that should be accomplished, but having the risk 
of care aligned with those who are providing is a critical part of it. Right now what we have are people paying for care who have no reference and that, like any other part of the economy that creates misalignment. But I would say that that's um, what um, Governor Levitt has just described is exactly what is in the framework and exactly what is being tested for the first time all over the country uh, with accountable care organizations with paying for bundled care. So for instance, you um, or I go in to have my knee replaced. And in the past, you know, there are a series of specialists that I would see up until the point of the surgery. And then there's, you know, somebody who's selling the device and a surgeon and an anesthesiologist and so many days in the hospital and rehab. And then I might get an infection and come back in. And each of those, as um, was described, is, is a separate stream, a separate billing. They may or may not talk to each other. They may or may not coordinate. I may have duplicate tests run, um, I may be given 14 different drugs. That system now is being looked at as um, one payment mm -hmm. for a knee replacement. And actually, um, the payment going to both the doctor and the hospital accounts for not only what happens to me in the hospital, but the 30 days after I get out of the mm -hmm. hospital, recognizing that it's very critical that I do my rehab and don't get infection and somebody checks on me so I don't come back into the hospital. And actually aligning payment with that strategy not only integrates and coordinates that care because the payment stream is all the same, and, um, but we now have a base of electronic health records that did not exist prior to 2008 where all hospitals and the vast majority of doctors can now see charts and C frames and share information. And finally, the payments are aligned with keeping people healthy in the first place. So if I get out of the hospital faster, if I go through my rehab uh, on a more expedited basis, if I don't get an infection, I, the payment is the same uh, as if I were to go back in. And so there is finally a beginning of an alignment of paying for really more efficient care, more coordinated care, expedited care. You don't run 50 more tests because frankly, if you run 100 tests, you're gonna get paid the same as if you run two tests. Um, you need to do the, you know, the appropriate care and there's a risk adjustment for sicker patients. But the kind of system that Mike is talking about is actually what people are testing and trying right now. And CMS has said in their own timetable, there were zero, zero percent of the payments out of the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services mm -hmm. in 2011 had any value proposition at all, zero percent. Mm -hmm. We're now at 20 percent in 2015. It's going to go to 30 percent next year and by 2018 be 50 percent. That's a, an amazing shift. And for the rest of the care, there will be quality measures attached to it. So the new system is at least being framed right now. And with Medicare, $580 billion a year in health spending. Mm. If that move is made, private employers make the move, health systems make the move, it changes the whole way we think about health Do you think healthcare. you can have Medicare make that move if uh, you had your pen right now? Um, Medicare will likely be among the slowest to do it. The private sector is moving much more qu uh, quickly to adopt this. Uh, could I say that I, I think what uh, Kathleen has said, uh, there is very little disagreement among Republicans and Democrats on that point, on the point that she's making. In fact, I think you can clearly argue that when the bill was written, um, that they, the reason there's agreement between Republicans and Democrats is because many of the ideas were things on which there was agreement before. But if you take the Affordable Care Act, you can really break it into four basic boxes. The first is getting everyone insured. Uh, the second is uh, what, what Kathleen is talking about in finding ways in which we can make the system more efficient. The third uh, box would be shifting wealth to pay for getting everyone insured. And the fourth is who gets to make all the decisions about this. Mm -hmm. There's very little disagreement on the piece that we're talking about. There is disagreement on how you get everyone insured, not if. 
and there is a lot of disagreement on how you pay for this in terms of the, how much can be afforded, and there's a lot of disagreement on how much the role of government should be in place. Mm -hmm. This is an ongoing discussion. That is to say, rarely is there a piece of legislation that simply solves an issue this complex. This is an iterative process. I think we're going to see another round of discussion over time, and, and it, it, it just has to be that way. Speaking of iterative processes <laughs> and Lyndon Johnson, your father was there in, the, in Congress during this period we talked about where people could what? gather together, make the compromise, give Everett Dirks in the pen. Is it possible now to do what Governor Levitt said, which is have Democrats and Republicans come together to make the fixes? Well, I think you've seen recently some encouraging um, news out of, particularly out of the Senate, uh, the, uh, well, in the House, too, to have um, Leader Pelosi and Speaker Boehner negotiate a SGR fix, that, that is sustainable growth rate fix that's been talked about forever and probably is the single biggest threat to Medicare um, mm -hmm. existing, uh, but it hasn't ever been solved. It looks like the Senate will adopt that bipartisan measure that passed the House. That's very good news, and that's a contentious issue that hasn't been solved. The recent announcement out of the Foreign Relations Committee that there's a unanimous vote on the Senate side around a structure um, for oversight of an Iran mm -hmm. treaty, potentially. Um, I think there is clearly conversation going on, engagement going on, um, but I, I think that you know, this isn't me talking. There are a lot of people who would say this is the most polarized Congress. Uh, it doesn't look anything like now. In 64, 65, when my dad was there, um, there were so many Democrats, you didn't really have to compromise with many people, although there was an effort to bring Republicans along. Um, I think, you know, this is a change Congress where both on the Democratic side and the Republican side, because of redistricting and because of the way lines are drawn, particularly in the House, but people uh, come. Not to correct or, or push back too much, but yeah, there were a lot of Democrats. But you needed Everett Dirksen, let us say, because Richard Russell was not going to be on that civil rights bill, for example. We are now more ideologically split as opposed to having both parties uh, have shifting alliances. That well, I, I think that's right. And I think the, the kind of gifted and extraordinary hands-on person by person political skill that Lyndon Johnson has that was pretty unparalleled before or since, um, I would say is not one of President Obama's strengths. He'd be the first to say that. Um, I, they keep restarting, you know, trying to engage, uh, but he has not been a hands-on relationship builder uh, in the way, certainly, no one has done it the way Lyndon Johnson did it, I would suggest, but um, there have been lots of others who have done a lot more outreach, and I think that is one of the one of the issues and well, problems. Well, the president you served was that way, and so especially was his father. Let me ask you, and then I'm going to turn it up. I know people here would rather ask questions than hear me do it, but here's a tough one. Suppose the Supreme Court, you know, knocks the um, underpinnings of the coverage part of the Affordable Care Act. Um, what fix would you suggest as a, I'll call you a moderate Republican who cares about this issue? Well, I think the first thing that will settle in as a realization is that this will have an effect on millions of people. Mm -hmm. And so there will have to be some way of being able to find a solution to this. There will be those, uh, I suspect, who will say, oh, this is the great opportunity for us to just blow this whole thing up and therefore we ought to do it. It's important for America. And then there'll be those who say, uh, we can't deal with the problem of 11 or 12 million people who'd be affected by it. And I expect that if that were to occur, there would be some form of solution legislatively or regulatory that would at least bridge the period during which time a solution needed to come up. Needed. And I think this is part of the iterative process that, mm -hmm. that we go through as a society. Speaking of iterative processes, I was just remembering uh, 10 years ago, I don't think it was to the day, but 10 years ago this month, uh, when we were celebrating the 40th anniversary of 
Medicare. As secretary, I went to the Harry Truman Museum, and I sat on the same stage, and I used the same desk. Hmm. Uh, and as a Republican, I signed an order beginning the implementation of Medicare Part D. Mm -hmm. And we went there uh, for the purpose of celebrating an American ethic. And it is one of great caring for those who are elderly and who are in hardship. And as we celebrate this uh, today, I think what we're celebrating is that ethic. It, it is not simply the process that Medicare has been perfect or that Medicaid is the way it needs to be. We're celebrating an ethic of caring. And, and part of that caring, I think, has to be finding ways to solve problems that will perpetuate that ethic while at the same time acknowledging that there are serious problems that have been created by our excess consumption under those programs, that we have created very serious challenges that will require significant change. And it's going to require the kind of, uh, hopefully not crisis-driven change, but it will require change. And if the crisis gets enough, then I think clearly they will respond. And Walter, I think that that's, that's a great point. Um, the same ethic that compelled multiple presidents and finally ended with Lyndon Johnson's success to broaden health care coverage, uh, particularly at this point for seniors and the most disabled people, I think is the ethic that carried forward and compelled you know, this president to put on the table a bill that provided the financial security and some sort of way to expand coverage to that portion of the population that didn't have affordable coverage in the workplace and weren't 65. Mm -hmm. You know, were dying to be 65 so they could have health coverage, but weren't there yet. Um, and that ethic of, you know, it is fundamentally um, unacceptable to have people go bankrupt because they get sick or to have some people have great health care and other people have no access, I think is, is one that Republicans and Democrats do share. And they may have different ways to get there, but I think it continues on today because you saw, you know, between the time that President Johnson signed this bill and um, the time that President Obama in 2010 signed the mm -hmm. Affordable Care Act, president after president put forward mm -hmm another kind of stab at comprehensive health reform to, to continue to move. So that yeah. ethic continues. Um, That's a very inspiring you know, thought, the notion of this all being part of an American ethic. And it really does require not only iterative process, but real partnerships and collaboration. I really can think of nobody better than the two of you, and I'll give a plug with the Aspen Institute, both of you are here today, but also have been involved in this. And I think Ruth Katz is creating a group that will also have Governor Tommy Thompson. And it would be kind of great if we could just get people of good faith like Governor Thompson uh, and the two of you to help work these things through. Let me open it up, if I may. Um, and yes, sir. Stand, shout, we'll repeat. Yeah. Thank you very much. My name is uh, Keith Martin from the Consortium of Universities for Global Health. Firstly, Secretary Sebelius, uh, I want to thank you for your work on the ACA. There are thousands of people who will be alive tomorrow, and the arc of their lives uh, are changed because of the Affordable Care Act, so thank you for that. My question is, uh, there are a sea of people wandering uh, in this city and in many other areas uh, whose lives have fallen through uh, the cracks of life. Uh, public health is where the big bang for the buck is in reducing the costs for uh, health care in this country to vastly improve outcomes and to change the inequalities within this country. Can you share with us how you see the low-cost, high-impact public health interventions that can dramatically affect and improve health care in this country and health outcomes? How do you see those being implemented? Because we know what we need to do and how to do it. Thank you. Well, I think there. Um, I think first of all, you're you're right, and um, there are some pieces of this that clearly need further iteration. I am deeply troubled and disturbed by the result of the Supreme Court decision on Medicaid that now we are growing a a sort of two-state 
solution where there are lots of people in this country who are actually too poor to qualify for financial help without Medicaid expansion. And um, we're seeing the results of that. Um, there is an effort, and I think an appropriate effort, to you know, double the size of community health centers, which have been essential um, entities to deliver low-cost, high-quality, primary preventive care, and bring doctors, now dentists, mental health professionals, and others into the most underserved communities. And, and that has been a great success, and that's on its way to being expanded. Uh, but I, I think you know, public health is also um, very, I don't know what Governor Levitt's situation was in Utah. I can tell you as a governor in Kansas, it was almost impossible to get funding for public health uh, because there, it's an unseen constituency. We were terrible. I mean, we would put money in the budget every year and it would be taken out every year and we'd have big battles. Um, so preventing something from happening, keeping people well in the first place, you know, having an ability to have a healthier population, I think is, is intangible to the point that it's difficult to allocate resources. Um, having said that, I think there's a great focus and a doubling down now on the two primary underlying causes of a lot of chronic health conditions, which is smoking and obesity and an effort at the state and local level among providers, among families, uh, uh, business owners, a lot of people in the private sector to see what it is that we can do here in the United States to actually dramatically decrease the number of new smokers and help people stop smoking cigarettes, but also deal with obesity where we, we can, lead the world. Let me see if I get Governor Levin on the very specific community health, public health, alternative systems? I, I had the pleasure of leading the Environmental Protection Agency in America for a while, um, and I came to realize it, it, was a, it is a public health entity. And I came to recognize that many of the advances in health and in longevity uh, that we have had in this country came during a period where we cleaned the air and the water and the land. And there's a direct reflection on our health. Uh, that's a public health. But I also think it's important in this context to recognize that there's a limit uh, in the way we, we can do this. Uh, we, don't, we don't have any public health money in our country to date. States are simply not appropriating money because they're paying for Medicaid. Their, Medicaid. their budget is just simply being used with Medicaid. Medicaid. Uh, we're investing less in higher education now than at any time in the last three decades Tuitions are skyrocketing. Student debt is skyrocketing. We're, why? It's because it's all going to Medicaid. So it's not an illogical con concern that, that we're seeing. When I became governor of Utah, my budget was 6% Medicaid. Today, in, in the state where I governed, and across the country, on average, it's 22% of the entire budget. Where did that come from? It came from other things that need to happen. And, so the, 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 it, that doesn't mean we ought to be dispassionate or we ought to lose our compassion. It means we've got to find a better way to do this. And that's the, the issue so many times comes down to the sense of, is, the, is, the, is the, the response here just the government needs to write more checks or do we need to actually change? And there are some very serious changes happening uh, uh, in, in our society that are important. Uh, a couple of days ago, I was in an airport and... Uh, I had just had my plane delayed for the second time. It was clear I wasn't going to leave until 11 o'clock. I wouldn't get home until midnight or after. All I could think about was a Big Mac and fries. <laughs> and I went to um, the, the Golden Arches in the airport. And um, it, it listed the price, but it also said I would be consuming 1,350 calories <laughs> if I had the Big Mac and fries. It made me a little irritated, frankly, that it was there. <laughs> but it was there because the government had concluded that rather than just write a check, maybe they ought to put a little of the responsibility on me and that I ought to make a decision about whether it's the Big Mac and fries or a le or lettuce wrap. Uh, and <laughs> I'm not going to tell you which one I had. But oh, come uh, on. <laughs> lettuce wrap I was and actually fries. quite responsible. <laughs> but 
my, my point is, we, we can't celebrate Medicaid and Medicare without recognizing for it to be here another 50 years and for all of the other good things that we, have, we expect to happen in our community, we have to do this better. Mm -hmm. It isn't simply a function of celebrating and moving on exactly the way we have in the past. Uh, questions, please. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, would you, uh, while we're waiting for the next question, um, I'd like to, oh, I'm sorry, there's a microphone there. Yeah, all right, go ahead. I'm sorry, I have trouble with the lights in it, my it's eyes. It's coming. Oh, okay. Um, I don't know I'm an old newspaper reporter. I wasn't around when this was signed, but I was around for the launch. But uh, now I live in Loudoun County, Virginia, and I regret to say that, first of all, our community health center has had to close down because of financing to lay off doctors and so on. And secondly, uh, I'm delighted to hear that uh, you're trying to control the use of tests. But let me tell you what the hospital in my area is doing. They are sending around mailers frequently saying, uh, come and be tested low cost. We'll send out a big van, it's like a big moving billboard, and we will perform tests that will help you avoid stroke and cancer and whatnot. Well, if you check the list of tests they're offering with what the preventive, U.S. Preventive task, uh, task Force recommends as appropriate for people with certain ages, you find there is a very poor match between those. And what the hospitals are doing, and this is, uh, Loudoun County is not the only place that's being done, is that they are building themselves people who get uh, test results that are concerning and that builds business for the hospitals to do further testing. Can also have adverse health mm -hmm. effects. And I'm just concerned about how effective the Affordable Care Act is going to be on this issue because of this system that is going on. Now to be sure, I'm sure they catch some cancers and whatever early, but it is Right. A money-driven proposition, and I just wonder what your comment would let, be. Let me use that, if I may, to get Governor Levitt to drill down a little bit further on the whole notion of a different type of health system that would try to make healthy populations rather than send out vans to try to rack up tests and thus billing and reimbursements. Well, I think a good analogy to describe this uh, might be, uh, I've amused myself at times uh, thinking about what would happen if we bought a car in the same way we buy health care. Mm -hmm. uh, we would go to the dealership and we would say, I need a car. And they would say, well, we, we can see you do. Go pick one out and we will send you the bills uh, in a few weeks. And uh, so we would drive off the lot, and then a few weeks later, we'd get a bill from the tire maker, and then we'd get one from the chassis uh, manufacturer, and then one that, who installed the windshield. We'd get a long list of different bills, and no one would have had the responsibility to package up that car and to deliver it. Well, the way we buy a car is that there is a contractor, the car company, who works with the people who do the windshields and the, car, the tires and the upholstery and they bring it all together and deliver it in a way that we have accountability as to whether we think it's a good car or whether it's a good buy and we have a sticker that says this is the amount. Well, in, our, our system now does not allow for that kind of coordination and that kind of accountability and what Kathleen is describing and what I believe or I have worked to describe is a system where there is greater accountability because there is a contractor, if you will, whose job it is to assemble the parts and to be responsible for the result. Uh, and they refer to this as beginning to reward value as opposed to volume. And I, I think that's uh, the system you've described is a situation where we, you know, you've got one part who is out manufacturing way too many steering wheels, if you will, and there's no one out there trying to put them all together into a picture of health. Uh, I hope that helps, Walter. 
Mm -hmm. Well, and I think um, the government isn't the contractor. The government ultimately in this situation in Medicare and you know in Medicaid is the payer, but the providers become the contractor. Somebody takes primary responsibility for coordinating that care, and typically it will be the primary care provider, your doctor, who will then have uh, not only the ability to share information and coordinate care, but also have a you know financial incentive to get you through the system. And I think it, it potentially has a huge, you know, the buzzword in a lot of health systems now is patient-centered care. Um, and I think it, it envisions a system where rather than you as in an individual trying to find all the people who might mm. improve your health, and particularly for somebody who's got a chronic disease, there are multiple people and multiple appointments and multiple, that, that that's part of your health care, that that system. And should that system be connected to the insurance system so that you have an aligned interest among Well, that's the, the whole point, to, to finally shift the financial alignments. The government spends $1 trillion a year between Medicaid and Medicare. Mm -hmm. That's a third about of the health spending, mm -hmm. um, comes out of government entities, and shifting that financial money to the outcomes that people feel are better for the patient, to coordinated care, to paying for value, to measuring what's happening across the system and seeing who the outliers are, mm -hmm. is a very different way of doing business, as opposed to, as Mike said, you know, pay for the tires. And it, it you know, in your car, most cars have four tires and maybe one in the trunk, five tires. But, um, you know, in the old days, you could actually pay for 25 tires mm -hmm. because somebody thought that was a really good idea and put 20 of them in the garage and five in the car and then pay for six steering wheels and um, none of which drive the car. But hopefully those days are, are, you know, beginning to be realigned. So finances aligning with outcomes. Can I also say that uh, part of this equation has to be an acknowledgement that this isn't just the system. It's a social change we all have to make. It's about the way we behave. It's what we eat. It's the way we exercise. That's what's ultimately, it's the way we, the high risk behaviors we engage in. All of this has to be part of the solution. This, just, this isn't a, a piece of legislation or a new design of care. This is a social change. Now, back to Medicare. We mentioned Medicare Part D. Uh, that was the most significant addition or change to Medicare since in, in the 50 years of its existence. But it was important for two reasons. Not only did it provide prescription drugs to people, it, in, it, it, it created a new delivery mechanism. It said, for the first time, we think consumers actually could have a role in choosing the plan and the benefits that they need and want and that they could make better choices than if we just had one Medicare program that everybody had exactly the same. Mm -hmm. Now, you might be interested to know that there was a default plan under which seniors could just take the default. It turns out that only 6% took the default, and that 94% concluded that if they could choose the way it was aligned, they could do a better job for them than what the government would do. That didn't mean government didn't have an obligation. It didn't mean government wasn't involved. It means that government was used to organize a marketplace where seniors could be able to make these decisions. There were people who were skeptical about whether they could. We now have a generation of health consumers who are making very thoughtful converse, uh, decisions about what they about what they want and need. And if they don't get what they want and need, they go somewhere else. And what we're seeing is that people are happy with the system that most all, everyone now has enrolled, uh, and, and we have a lot of satisfaction with it. And I, I, I'm of the view that that will be a big part of the future mm -hmm. in some form of Medicare, is that we'll begin to see consumers take a larger role in guiding the system in terms of the way they, they interact with it. Our time is about run out, but let me let each of you sort of have a quick closing thought if you want. 
Well, I, I want to actually thank the Aspen Institute for organizing this. I think it's, um, it, we have a uniquely American health system, insurance system, delivery system um, that is watched all over the world. Um, lots of people are confused about some of the pieces of what we do, but I think there's no question um, it, it by and large works for a lot of people. And celebrating um, these two important framework laws is important, but I think as, as Mike has suggested also, finding ways as we move forward to continue. I mean, this is a, a work in progress and it's a continuous work in progress that needs to um, continue to be improved upon uh, as we go forward. Governor Willett. I would like to end by saying, I am more optimistic right now than I have been in a decade about the chances that the United States is going to actually create a uniquely American solution to this problem. My optimism, frankly, is not based on the Affordable Care Act. I mean, we have a long discussion about that. I think many of the good things that have happened have been unintended consequences of the law, as it often is. I'm optimistic because I'm beginning to see people do hard things that they've been unwilling to do in the past. Maybe it's because of the financial pressure that's now there. Maybe it's because we're finally getting the picture. But I'm seeing people walk up to, just like I did, we're now choosing lettuce wraps a little more often than we did Big Macs in the same way that we quit smoking and we're starting to focus on obesity and we're all starting to think about that more. We haven't succeeded yet. But we're starting to see combinations in the health system changes where people are merging and making decisions that are financially driven but absolutely required for the system to become better. So I'll just leave with optimism. Uh, I, I, we're not there yet. We're a long ways from there. We have, to we have to remodel and change many of the things we're doing in Medicaid and Medicare for it to be around 50 years from now. But I have optimism that we will because Americans have had this knack of when the chips are down, we make changes. And I think that's what we're talking about here is really big change. And as far as I can see, there's really only three ways we can deal with it. We can fight it and die. Uh, uh, be overcome by events. We can accept it and have a chance to fix this, or we can lead it. And if we do, we'll prosper. And I'm optimistic that 50 years from now, someone will be sitting on an Aspen Institute stage uh, celebrating 100 years of these, uh, of these great programs, but they won't be the same programs today, uh, and they will survive because we modernized and changed along with the times. Governor and Secretary Levitt, Governor and Secretary Sibelius, thank you all very much. <laughs>